friend of mine mentioned that she sometimes wears suntan lotion indoors, which I found surprising. I would have thought that ordinary glass windows attenuate or reflect most of the UV, but apparently, under some conditions, enough light can come through to damage your skin. Now, there's no harm in wearing suntan lotion when you don't need to, but since my friend's birthday was just around the corner, I thought it'd be funny to get her a UV meter. Unfortunately, it turns out that UV meters are actually quite expensive, at least more than what I'd normally drop on a gag birthday gift anyway, so instead I thought I'd do my usual thing and build a trinket or a bit of jewellery on the lathe. But I was wondering, why are those UV meters so expensive? The component itself that detects UV is just a glorified LED, right? It's a, it's a UV photodiode. And yes, it turns out you can buy a UV photodiode for not very much money. And this is when I had the idea to build an amulet. An amulet is a magical device that bestows protection on the wearer, but I could build an amulet that really does glow or light up when it detects UV. And as soon as I had that idea, I thought I've got to make it happen. So the very first thing I did was choose and order a sensor. You can get just bare UV photodiodes, but instead I went for this part, the VEML6075, which is an integrated sensor with an I2C interface. I was drawn to this one because it has separate channels for UVA and UVB. In the end, I totally regret choosing this part for reasons that will become apparent later, but for now, this thing looked perfect for the job. It's available on these cute little breakout boards as well, which is useful for testing, but for the actual thing, it's a service mount part, so we will need to mount it on a PCB. And that sets the timeline for the entire project, really. If we have to design and order a PCB, then we have to do that right now, or we'll have no chance of meeting our deadline. But that's boring, so let's do some metal work. The only fixed dimension in this whole project is going to be the size of the battery. In the past I've made the mistake of using very small, obscure batteries that are hard to replace, so this time I definitely wanted to use a CR2032, a super popular and most people already have them. 2032 means that it's 20mm in diameter and 3.2mm thick. The plan is to hollow out this bit of brass to make enough room for the battery and a circular PCB that will sit on top of it. Let's assume the PCB will be 21mm diameter, just to give some wiggle room for the battery. This is free machining brass and, as you can see, using a blunt carbide insert with the wrong geometry causes no problems at all. I don't have any proper tools for measuring inside diameters, so the best way to get this accurate is to improvise a plug gauge. I turned a smooth diameter onto the end of this scrap steel before I started, and we look for the moment where we can just barely fit it inside. We only need to do this once, because from here we can reach all our other dimensions using the DRO. I want an internal shoulder to support the PCB, and a flange at the front can have an opening for the sensor, the controls and the display. If you think it's hard to see what's going on, then remember that the camera has a much better view of the action than I do. I'm basically blind at this point, going entirely off the numbers on the DRO, 
The PCB, the battery, and a spring between them will have a depth which I have carefully calculated. So the last part to think about is the battery cover. Let's blue it with a sharpie, and then it's time to thread. A lot of people are surprised I can make fine, precision threads on a machine as big as this Colchester lathe. Here's the lathe, along with a human figure for scale. The fact is, I find it much easier to use this big machine than my little lathe at home. First of all, the Colchester has a proper gearbox, so setting the thread pitch is as easy as pulling a few levers. Secondly, the VFD and the camlock chuck mean we can run the lathe backwards without worrying about the chuck unscrewing from the headstock and causing a disaster. That means we can engage the half nut and leave it there for the entire session, running the lathe backwards and forwards and never having to worry about thread timing. It also means we can cut the threads in reverse. I sometimes give metalworking lessons, and these are a couple of demonstration pieces I've made. And these were made using a tool like this. This is an internal threading tool, hand ground, and this is used to make the internal threads in the conventional way, but also to make the external threads by going behind the part and running the lathe backwards. Whenever you do something unconventional like this, it's always a good idea to stop and think, are we going to cut a left-handed thread by accident? But so long as we haven't touched the gearbox, the handedness shouldn't have changed. Another thing that can catch us out is that by repeatedly changing direction, we now have to worry about backlash in the gearbox. So what I normally do is I pull a tool out too far, uh, run behind, and then run forwards into position. Um, on this part, there's, we've got an undercut, so you could actually just sit in the groove, start cutting, and uh, the tool will rest there until the backlash is taken up and it starts cutting. But for today's project, we are threading right up to the shoulder, so an undercut is not acceptable. I found these fine pitch thread chasers in the tool room, and I've always been confused about what these are for. I've only ever encountered thread chasers in the context of a wood lathe, but with a 0.5mm pitch, these are obviously not for wood. It might be significant that someone's ground a negative rake into one of them. That does suggest they are for cleaning up threads rather than cutting them. But given how easily this brass machines, I don't see why we can't just set this slightly above centre and use it to cut. For threading up to a shoulder, you could not ask for better than that. It's a shame the internal tool seems to be damaged on the end, so we can't use it in reverse like I was talking about. If these were my own tools, I would just touch the end off with a grinder, but they're not, so I shan't. It's even more important than normal to get the tool lined up perpendicular. I'm just eyeballing it with the straight edge, but I'm eyeballing it carefully. Oh, God! We're okay! Rinse and repeat. Let's shave the outside down, as thin as we dare. 
before we part this off, let's take a moment, a long moment, to polish the outside. I've obviously covered the bed to keep the abrasive dust away, then we work our way through the grits from 400, 600, 800, right up to 2000, and then we switch to the Brasso Polishing Compound, which has an effective grit of about 10,000, though it may also have some chemical polishing action too. I keep applying it and wiping it off with tissue paper, and then all of a sudden, mirror finish. Almost. We're parting into a ball, so this won't take long. I put my hand underneath, ready to catch it. Any second now. Ready to catch it. About to part off. Any second now. Ready to catch it. Any second now. Damn it! Okay, time for the mail thread. You know, 0.5mm is the same thread pitch used on most watch backs. It is kind of like a watch, what we're making here. You know, it's round, it's threaded, it has a battery, whatever. Fine, we'll give it a tiny undercut. Perfect. Let's take this opportunity to clean up the front face of the other part. If we just parted this off, we'd get a working battery cover, 
The original plan was to simply make the threaded portion shorter to give more space for the battery, but now I'm thinking it might be possible to have a recessed section that keeps the battery centred. If I'd thought of this sooner, I'd have given myself more room for it, but as it is, we're working with very tight tolerances. Oh, before I forget, now is the best time to scratch a polarity marking onto the battery cover. I've mounted a single point threading tool sideways in the tool rest, and we'll just scratch a plus sign using the hand wheels. In hindsight, through the macro lens it's easy to see how I could have done this better, but with the naked eye, especially with a camera in the way, it's really hard to see what you're doing. Naturally, this parting tool wasn't long enough to go all the way through, and mounting a bigger one is more effort than just grabbing a hacksaw. We need to clean this face up anyway, and I'm also wondering if we need to add a slot so that you can use a coin to open it if it gets stuck. We'll see how it goes. We're nearly there, just one more part to make, the attachment point, or hoop. Number of ways you can go about this, but I like to make a little ball and drill a hole through it. In the absence of a ball turner or form tool, the best way to make a little ball is with your eyeballs and a needle file, or a graver if you've got one. Polish it up, and before we part it off, let's take this over to the milling machine. ER32 collet in a square holder, which makes it very easy to get things perpendicular. The end mill is also held in an ER32 collet, which means we have to have a whole load of stick out. You can see the part deflecting as I plunge. Not enough to cause problems though. One day we'll invest in a smaller collet system. <laughs> 
and I set about turning the wool thickness as thin as we dare, you may have thought I was being a bit cowardly, leaving it almost a millimetre thick, but that's because I knew we'd need enough meat left on it for mounting the attachment point. We want a divot, a dimple, a depression, a flat spot, and I've got just the ticket. I'm going to soft solder these two pieces together, mainly because I'm lazy. If you hard solder or silver solder, the higher temperatures discolour and oxidise the metal, which means more work cleaning it up. Regular leaded solder will easily be strong enough for this application. I'm normally pretty good at this, but what with looking through the viewfinder and trying not to point the blowtorch at my expensive camera equipment, I did a pretty sloppy job this time. The solder should only flow to where you've put flux, but I happen to be using flux coated solder wire, so in fact it'll stick to anywhere that's up to temperature. Still, so long as we get a nice fillet around the join, we're still good, and since it's soft solder we can scrape away the excess pretty easily afterwards. Finally, let's add a brass ring just so that whatever chain we hang it from keeps the amulet facing forwards. Classic bit of wire bending. I'd like to think that there are a few jewellers watching and cringing so hard that their teeth melt. You know what they say, jack of all trades, master of none. Speaking of which, it's about time we did some electronics. It's only as I came to design the circuit I realised we could have made the whole thing solar powered. It's only going to get used in direct sunlight, so we wouldn't have needed a battery. Oh well, too late now, we've made a battery holder, so we're going to use it. The things we need to decide are how to display the reading, LEDs, a graph, or whatever, what processor to use, what switch to use, or how to turn it on and off, let's call that interface, and lastly, what visual design to give it. For the display, I did think about trying to use an analogue needle, but basically it's got to be LEDs of some kind. On the one hand, I wanted to have that Tolkien-esque feeling of a magical sword that lights up when danger is near. On the other hand, I want it to be scientific and useful, able to quantify differences in light levels. So a bar graph, or really it needs to be two bar graphs, one for UVA and one for UVB, or even three if we're to display UV index, that's the weighted average that tells you if you ultimately need to wear sunscreen. Eventually, I decided to go with one bar graph and multiple display modes that are cycled through when you operate the switch. For the processor, pretty much any ATtiny chip will do, 
All it's got to do is read some data from the sensor and display it on some LEDs. It would be nice if it had I2C master, but I2C is easy enough to bit bang that it doesn't really matter. For the Charlie Star project, I used an ATtiny9. This is a SOC23 package. And to be honest, these chips are rubbish. They're underpowered, they're difficult to load your code onto, and in the scheme of things, they're not even that small. Quite a few of the better ATtiny chips are now available in VQFN format. This is like a miniature version of QFN. This is a 3mm squared chip with 20 pins at 0.4mm pitch. And I like these chips a lot. Um, it's about as small as you could hope for. It's basically the same footprint as the SOC23, but it's still reasonably easy to solder. Unlike the ball grid array packages, you can visually inspect if it's soldered correctly. You can get the ATtiny85 in this package, but it's kind of pointless because with only eight pins, the rest are just not connected. So instead I went for the ATtiny84, which is basically the same, but with a few more IO pins. And of course, for prototyping, it is available in a dip package. After a lot of thinking and searching, I was unable to come up with a physical switch which I felt was satisfying, which led me to thinking about CapSense. I normally hate capacitive sensing, but in this case there is an appeal to having it magically respond when you touch it. The problem is that actively sensing means it's always draining battery power, even when it's turned off. You can fake CapSense by having exposed traces on a PCB, which a human finger will short together. Just have one of them with a very weak pull-up, maybe 10 mega ohms, and the finger will short it to ground. This will have almost no standby power usage, but doing it this way is notoriously unreliable. Even if the traces are gold-plated, they will get dirty and the resistance will change. It also depends on humidity and how dirty or moist the finger is. And there's the additional worry of electrostatic discharge damaging it. Using Atmel's QTouch library is completely off the cards. It's way too power hungry. Despite all of their claims of low power, if you pull out all the stops, the best you can hope for is about 100 microamps. Even if you didn't use the amulet at all, that would still it'll drain a full battery in about three months, which is unacceptable. This app note actually concedes, if you want really low power, use a dedicated CapSense chip. Here is a dedicated CapSense chip, the TTP223. It claims to use as little as 1.5 microamps, although in my measurements it was more like 5 or 6. Even so, that will last for years in standby, so I think we're okay. Let's jump straight to the finished circuit since I'm probably boring everyone to death. There's a 4x3 LED matrix with two groups of four being the bar graph. The CapSense chip has to be tied to int zero, that's on PB2, so it can wake the processor from the deepest sleep state. There are no pull-ups on the I2C lines, the bus is so short that we won't need them. And I'd not yet investigated how good the sleep mode on the sensor itself is, but we can guarantee it won't use any power in sleep mode by cutting the power to it entirely. It's powered from a GPIO pin on the ATtiny. This row of test pads is for programming. I'm not even making a jig, I'm just going to solder to it, load up the code, then unsolder it. I built the circuit on a breadboard, and rather unhelpfully, that breakout board for the UV sensor has a bunch of other stuff on it. A regulator, and pull-up resistors, and level shifters, so I made my own breakout soldering directly to one of the sensors. It's only 2mm long, but it's only 4 pins, and I do enjoy a good bit of micro-soldering. We'll use the breadboard circuit to write our code while we wait for the PCB to arrive, but before we can order the PCB, we need to make our mind up about the visual design. If ever there was a time for a polar coordinate track routing plugin, it would be now. Sadly, there's no such thing. In fact, KiCad's polar coordinate system is pretty lacking. The components were positioned with a for loop in JavaScript where I just typed in the coordinates, and the tracks were routed freehand. As you can see, I've made the CapSense pad as big as possible. Got to be careful not to root tracks underneath it. We also don't want a full ground plane behind it, just a little bit of ground. The capacitor at the bottom is for sensitivity adjustment. I'll probably leave that unpopulated, but best to have the footprint just in case. The CapSense chip is the SOT23 part.
making it the biggest component on the board. The UV sensor is at the top, represented by this grey cuboid. All the LEDs are 0603, the ones on the right are the bar graph, and on the left are the mode indicators. The scale for UV index really does go up to 11. I did make a quick 3D model of the case, just to give an idea of how this is going together. It's added as a virtual component. The idea is that it will surface mount onto the ring around the edge of the PCB. This will both mechanically secure the board into the case, and provide the other contact for the battery. The plated holes at the side are to help me with the soldering process, since I don't expect it to be an easy one. So there's this conspicuous space in the middle. The colours aren't accurate, it's going to be all black. And that's where our logo or symbol is going to go. Something you tap to get the amulet to spring to life. And I spent so much time trying to think of the right symbol to use. My first idea was a pentagram, because that originally was a symbol of protection. You often see it on amulets, but I got worried when someone suggested it's associated with Satanism. I really don't want to go to all this effort of making an amulet and then the recipient doesn't want to wear it because of satanic associations. So I looked at other symbols of the sun, and of protection, and nearly everything suitable has been co-opted as a symbol of white supremacy. About half of these symbols look like swastikas. The swastika itself was originally a symbol of good luck, and then the Nazis went and ruined everything. We could potentially use the Eye of Horus, an ancient protection symbol used on amulets, or the Eye of Ra represents the sun, but aesthetically I wasn't pleased with how these looked on the amulet, especially in white on black. They just didn't have, they didn't seem to fit into the radial symmetry of the rest of it. I did eventually generate some Gerbers with this cartoon sun with UV written on it, and while it's completely inoffensive, it's also completely boring. I wasn't happy, and went back to my first idea of the pentagram. Further research shows that the satanic pentagram is upside down. That's the goat's head thing. An upright pentagram does still represent protection. And to be honest, I don't think my friend is going to notice or care. Let's just order this PCB already so we can plow on with the software. This is one of those occasions where mixing C and assembly makes the most sense. The outline of the program is very simple. We just want to set a few registers, read some numbers, and show it on the LEDs. But bit banging the I squared C, that's much easier to do in assembly. There's also this formula with a bunch of coefficients to get from the raw numbers to the UV index, so it's nice to be able to do that in C. Much as I love reinventing the wheel, I took some existing I squared C master routines here, but we can't use them as is because I didn't add those external pull-ups. I squared C is an open collector or open drain bus where you have pull-up resistors and any device on the bus can pull the signal down to ground. But the AT Tiny is a CMOS device, which means it has push-pull outputs, and it takes a bit of work to emulate the open drain behaviour. We often call these outputs tri-state, but since we've got an internal pull-up that can be enabled, there are actually four possible states a GPIO pin can take. Floating, weakly pulled up, output high, and output low. We want to toggle between output low and weakly pulled up. These states are controlled by two registers, the direction register and the output register. So this is the perfect time to use macros. What else does the software have to do? The display matrix is just an interrupt and an array, got it to do a little animation, and wrote a routine to display numbers on the bar graph. AT tiny chips do not have a floating point unit, so as soon as you start using floats, the code size increases by about 4 kilobytes as GCC brings in its software float library. It's pretty slow, but it doesn't matter because all we're doing is multiplying a few numbers. The question is, what are the numbers? And for that, let's delve into the sensor and its documentation. The VEML6075. The first warning flag is that the manufacturer has completely disowned it. It's marked as obsolete, and they refuse to provide any documentation or support for it. They don't even acknowledge it was ever a part they produced. This is despite the fact that you can still buy the chip, and there are lots of examples on the internet of people using it. The main documentation is this monstrosity, which quite frankly reads like an undergraduate lab report. No offence to undergraduates. There are a bunch of channels on the sensor which read 16-bit numbers, and we have to multiply these numbers by some coefficients to get a calibrated reading. Fair enough. Except, 
there are multiple versions of this document, with no changelog, and the different versions have different coefficients. I mean, these are substantially different numbers, and there's no indication of why they're changed, or which ones you should use. Furthermore, the newer document has removed some of the registers. The whole dark current measurement section has been cut. Does that mean it wasn't relevant, or it was inaccurate, or that there's a newer version of the silicon that doesn't include that feature anymore? I tried reading from those registers, and they're non-zero, so I have no idea what to make of that. There's also this dynamic range adjustment, the entirety of the documentation for which is this. 1 equals high dynamic setting. What does it do? Does it reduce the count? Does it apply a non-linear gain curve? Were these coefficients earlier specified for normal dynamic setting or high dynamic setting? Why not write at least one sentence explaining what it does? The crazy thing is that there are loads of example projects and libraries that use this sensor, and they're all bloody wrong. It seems they've all copied and pasted the formula from this document, without thinking about it or even checking if it works. Running that code with the sensors I have here, bought from two different sources, leads to nonsensical numbers. There are instructions on how to calibrate the sensor yourself, but we shouldn't have to. The entire point of choosing the sensor over a bare UV photodiode is that, assuming we're not covering it with an enclosure, we don't have to do any calibration. Now let's take a look at what UV index is, and what the sensor is trying to do. On the electromagnetic spectrum, the light that our eyes can see is called visible light. But the spectrum extends in both directions to colours we can't see. Wavelengths longer than red are called infrared, and wavelengths shorter than violet are called ultraviolet. The entire rainbow of visible colours is only a teeny tiny bit of the spectrum, but because scientists are boring, the infrared colours are just called near-infrared and far-infrared, and the ultraviolet colours are called UVA, UVB, and UVC. The shorter the wavelength, the higher the frequency, and the higher the energy of that light. And as we head towards UV, the light has enough energy to start affecting chemical reactions, and under UVC, most life forms will get torn to shreds. Luckily, you may have noticed, the sky is blue, and the sun is kind of yellow, whereas in space, with no atmosphere, the sun is a lot closer to white. The atmosphere scatters and absorbs light in a way that's frequency dependent. The higher the frequency, the more it interacts with the atmosphere. So even though the sun is throwing off a whole load of UVC, basically none of it ever reaches the ground. Some UVB reaches the ground, although it's very dependent on the season, and a lot of UVA reaches the ground, but because it's lower energy, it doesn't do nearly as much damage to our skin. Of course, all this is far too complex for the plebs to understand. What we want is a single number that represents how much UV there is. This is the UV index. It's a weighted curve that we integrate over so that a little UVC counts for the same as a whole lot of UVA. If we want a sensor to tell us the UV index, it would have to sweep the whole spectrum totting up with the weighting curve, which obviously isn't practical. What the vast majority of sensors do is make a single measurement and extrapolate. We know, quite accurately, how the atmosphere behaves, so if the measurement at this particular frequency is known, we can infer the overall UV index. That's all well and good if you're outdoors looking at the sun, but in other situations, like under a UV lamp, or just indoors where the glass windows will have altered the frequency distribution, it's going to give you a completely wrong answer. This is why I was drawn to the Vemmel 6075, which makes multiple measurements at different frequencies, and should give a more accurate UV index. <sighs> I wish. I used a bus pirate and a Python script to test the sensor so we can see the exact numbers, and following the formula in the example, I was reading a UV index of 17. Now this was in London, about lunchtime in the middle of June, but even so, I don't think the index goes that high anywhere on the planet. If I had a calibrated UV meter to compare it to, that would just make things far too easy, so instead I started looking at the government DEFRA UV index graphs for the UK. There are a bunch of monitoring sites throughout the country which are plotted here, but most infuriatingly the London site is currently offline undergoing maintenance. Still, looking at the other sites, it's pretty amazing just how much the index changes throughout the day and throughout the year. When the sun is lower in the sky, the light travels through more atmosphere, and less of the UV makes it through. So even the sunniest day in December barely makes it to 0.5, while the same site in summer can reach 9 or more.
When it's cloudy, the index drops a variable amount, but looking at a bunch of sites, it seems so long as there aren't clouds above, most of the UK sites agree within one or two units. So if I can fudge my numbers a bit until the sensor agrees roughly with what the other sites are saying, I'll be happy enough. The amulet doesn't need to be that accurate, it just has to say whether you need suntan lotion. Well, okay, I also wanted it to compare UVA and UVB levels. Supposedly, UVB doesn't go through glass, but UVA does. Whether that's true, or in what proportion, is obviously also going to depend on the type of glass, the thickness, the angle of incidence, whether it's coated, whether it's double glazed. There are so many variables. Do we need to wear sunscreen indoors? I really wanted the amulet to answer that question. I tested the sensor while covering it with a plastic water bottle. PET plastic is pretty close to a brick wall filter at 300 nanometers, so covering the sensor should make the UVB reading drop to zero, while the UVA remains about the same. What I actually saw was both readings drop by about the same amount. And so we come to the most disappointing aspect of all the disappointing aspects of this sensor. I can't believe I didn't spot this sooner. It claims to be measuring UVB, it consistently refers to that channel as UVB, but if you actually look at the numbers on the sensitivity diagram, the UVB peak is about 330 nanometers. The ISO standard quite clearly states that UVB is considered from 280 to 315. So this Vemmel 6075, this supposed UVB sensor, is almost entirely measuring UVA, just two different flavors of it. It's far too late in the day to change sensor, so let's plow ahead and hope that nobody notices. I've always found that the best way to deal with such disappointments is to play with some noxious chemicals. I built two sets of metal parts on consecutive evenings, and I'm showing this because just look at how much the finish has degraded in 24 hours. This brass has some additives in it, which makes it machine nicely, but it seems to have the side effect of tarnishing extremely quickly. Normally I solve this problem by varnishing the pieces, but I've never been satisfied with that solution. So it's time to try something I've wanted to do for ages, that is, gold plating. I'm far too stingy to buy an off-the-shelf plating kit. The only thing we actually need to buy is the electrolyte. This is potassium cyanide. Apparently it's harmful. This tiny bottle contains 0.2 grams of gold. And yeah, if you drink it, you'll die. You won't get sick, you'll just straight up die. With electroplating, the most important thing is to make sure the parts are clean. Lacking any proper degreaser, I'm just soaking the parts in some diluted bleach, and you can tell how clean it is from the way the liquid gathers on the surface. If it forms droplets, then it's contaminated. If it wets it smoothly, then it's clean. That copper wire will be one electrical contact, and as for the anode, because I don't really know what I'm doing, I've folded this piece of kitchen towel and held it in a crocodile clip. Now we dip this in the cyanide, which has a rather dashing fuchsia colour, or maybe it's magenta. The power supply is at 5 volts, and then we just wipe this over all the surfaces. The colour change from brass to gold is very subtle. You can tell it's working because little bubbles of hydrogen are forming at the surface. At the same time, oxygen is generated at the crocodile clip, which is why it's corroding to all hell. I had to stop and scrape the oxides off several times, as that was adding resistance to the circuit, and the current dropped accordingly. Ooh, satisfying. I'm going over all the surfaces repeatedly because the gold finish is not as smooth as it could be, so we need to make the coating thick enough that it can survive another polishing afterwards. At last, the circuit board's arrived, and not a moment too soon. Kind of like little pogs, aren't they? Well, that doesn't look too bad. Commence soldering, I guess. <laughs> 
or be hand soldering most of this. The easiest way to do these 0603 parts is to put a blob of solder on one pad, then tack the part in place. Spin it around, solder the other side properly, and finally go back to the first joint and clean it up. I was too lazy to use a stencil. I suppose I'm afflicted by a unique kind of laziness where you end up doing more work. For the VQFN part, it's better to use too little solder than too much. We can always add more afterwards. Gently warm it with the heat gun, and... Yeah, maybe that wasn't enough solder. You can still see some worrying amounts of copper. Let's splat some more on there. Now's as good a time as any to confirm the chip is working, which means soldering all the test points on the back. It's also the perfect time to remember that better lighting is available. And with that, we can do the sensor, same deal as before. For the LEDs, it's important to get them centred and straight. If they're wonky, it's going to be really obvious when they light up. Oh man, did I mention I couldn't actually find anywhere to buy the TTP223? It's not a problem because I can just unsolder it from these breakout boards, but uh, it's about par for the course, isn't it? And finally, Last of the LEDs. Starring Daniel Day-Lewis. Incidentally, this footage has been sped up. The chip is flashed, the CapSense button works, the LEDs all light up. Now is the last chance we have to alter the code and behaviour before it gets locked in place forever. I'm mostly happy with it, but at the last minute I've decided to increase the gain on the A and B channels, because they're not calibrated units and the scale doesn't need to be the same. For the battery contact, I had planned to use a proper spring, but this pseudo paperclip will have to do. One disadvantage to using soft solder on the attachment point earlier is that if we overheat the part now, it'll all come apart and will have ruined everything. Also, because this thing is gold-plated, the solder will now stick anywhere, even without flux, and wreck the gold finish. Luckily, everything is under control. And the trick for this last part is that I'll flood these through holes with solder, then use them to transfer heat to the join from behind. I'm going to keep poking the circuit with tweezers until the solder melts and the joint lies flat. Turns on, goes through the modes, turns off again. Let's take it outside. At the time of filming, it's a very sunny day towards the end of June, and these LEDs are not going to be able to compete with direct sunlight, but it's okay because I anticipated this problem and added a feature where if you hold the pentagram, it will freeze the display. So you can take a measurement, then shade the display to be able to read it. Four LEDs corresponds to a UV index of about six, which agrees with the DEFRA website. I already regret making the scale go up to 11, 
If it only went up to 8, then one LED would be one unit on the scale. And let's be honest, if the index ever does go above 8, you probably don't need an amulet to tell you to wear sunscreen. How about indoors, by our sunny windowsill? The reading here is roughly a quarter of the UV index outside, which is believable, I suppose. I increased the gain on the individual channels by a factor of 4, so we can compare this with a higher resolution. I think the biggest variable is that the amount reflected by the window depends on the angle the sunlight hits it, which is always changing, so there isn't really a hard and fast rule about this. I'd love to keep playing with this, but unfortunately, the deadline looms, and there's one last thing we need to make before I can consider this project complete. The instruction manual! I had a vision for this, right from the very start of the project. It's not just a manual, or the nitty gritty details of how it works, it's about the symbolism, the magic, the fusion of art and science. And what I really wanted on the cover of the manual was an anime girl drooling over the render. That's done with Blender's freestyle render, and the Sailor Moon screenshot I put through Photoshop to give it a screen tone effect so it looks even more like a printed manga. Become a scientist. Of course, why build one when you can build two for twice the price? If you forget the lead time on the PCB, then this whole project was less than two weeks long, and yet it still somehow took me four months to edit the video. I have plenty more projects to make videos about, as and when I can find the time to do so. But if you enjoyed this, and you want to send me money, and you can put up with my erratic schedule, then consider joining my Patreon. Thanks for watching.